Okay, thank you very much. Yesterday, people from ThyssenKrupp were asking where Rory is. There's Rory. <laughs> you were seen in, um, in Petra. There were a couple of photographs of you in Petra. So, last year, I've got to show this again. It was, it was a nice photograph last year. There was Ingo Pletchen and Stefan, who's here. And I think what happened last year, I could not tell the difference between them. It was very embarrassing. Now, Ingo felt very guilty about causing that confusion. So, he decided he had to resign and join a different company. So he's gone to a different company. Now I feel guilty. So, uh, Gina said, calculation, then simulation. And we all have to do what Gina says. And I'll talk about that. The key to understanding the difference now, um, uh, we've got a bigger problem. Well, we've got a problem. I believe we've still got a problem. And this is where I'm talking about simulation. We, we still haven't uh, finished the problem or the discrepancy between calculation and simulation. I don't think anyone can, can, can argue that, that he or she has. Um, and I'm trying to uh, talk about that today. So um, there are two interesting lessons from economics and hygiene. Talk about system loading. And then I'm going to talk, I'm going to get delusions of grandeur and talk to you about my vision of a roadmap. So calculation, then simulation. It's common practice, everyone does calculation first. Then you go and fine tune the, the design. We usually find they don't exactly match. And usually there's a loss. I don't know if people agree, Joachim and others and so on, but I think there's a loss. There's usually a loss of 5 to 10%, and you've got to tweak things, um, do various things to get it. Now, why is there a discrepancy? Do we really understand why there is a discrepancy? Because I think if we start understanding the reason for the discrepancy, maybe we can start doing something about it. Richard done, did some interesting piece of work. Um, this was to do with the ISO step profile. Is that right? Or you just wanted to see the input and output? Different, different, different levels of separation. Um, Richard was looking at, uh, looking at the lift system as an input and an output and comparing the input to the output. So like control systems, those of you uh, uh, involved in control systems. So we would like the output of the control system to match the input. And it's getting saturated somewhere around 14 15%. You're getting some form of saturation. I've always said that a, an ideal simulator should meet the following requirements. It should be repeatable. If you, if you repeat the, uh, your simulation, you should get similar results. It should be reproducible, so others should be able to repeat your simulation and get the same results. It should be transparent, and I think transparency is the, is the most difficult one, and objectivity. Now, I'm, I'm suggesting that the main reason for the difference between the value of the round trip time and the calculation and simulation is, uh, is loading, car loading. And this is caused by having fewer passengers in the car than we were expecting. So we can't get the car to load to as much as we assumed. Now, P is an important uh, value here. P is the value that we calculated the round trip time based on when we did the calculation. So we assume the car will take 10 or 12 or 11 passengers in each round trip. Now, the reason for not getting the number of passengers in is the randomness. The system is a random system. There's randomness in the value of the round trip time. There's randomness in the passenger arrivals, as we've seen. And there's another third reason. So the first uh, uh, reason for randomness is passengers arrive in a Poisson arrival. Uh, now, if you had a sandwich shop at lunchtime or something, you would see that. You would see one passenger arriving in 50 minutes and then 10 passengers arriving after that. That's not very nice. You would have preferred that passengers arrive uh, uniformly so you can actually serve them in a much easier way. The second problem is you have random passenger destinations. People are going to different destinations, and that leads to variable values of round trip time. So sometimes you have a very short round trip, and sometimes you have a very long round trip. Remember that the value of the round trip time is actually a variable. It's not a constant. We've, we trick ourselves into believing that it's capital T or RTT, and it's a constant. But in fact, it's the average of a random variable. And then good old bunching. In, when we do the calculation, we're assuming that the first two um, are constant. We're assuming that the passengers arrive uniformly. We're assuming that the, destination, that the value of the round trip time is constant. And we're assuming that bunching is non-existent. This is an example of a software that calculates the round trip time using a Monte Carlo simulation. Look at this. This is actually a plot of the frequency of the values of the round trip time. So what this is saying, it's saying that the round trip time can go as low as 120, but not very frequently. It can go as high as 220 seconds, but not very frequently. 
but it spends most of its time somewhere around the 180. That's the real, that's the real characteristics of a round trip time. It's not constant. Don't believe it's constant. What you've calculated is an average of all of those. So the round trip time is varying wildly. It's varying from as low as 120 to as high as 220 seconds, and that's a problem. So the lift, when it disappears from the landing, it comes back, it's going to stay away for different periods of time. During that time, if it stays away for a long period of time, there are loads of passengers. If it st stays away for a short period of time, there are few passengers waiting. That's a big problem. That's one of the biggest problems. That's the passenger arrivals. They're arriving randomly. That's another problem. And good old bunching. So we have, here we have a smaller interval, and there we have a larger interval. And because the, uh, the lifts are not well behaved, You've had many more passengers accumulating during that period of time. Now, what do we do here? We've got a lift ready to leave. It's going to leave with fewer passengers. And any, any car leaving empty or partially full is a loss. And that's where we're losing capacity. So let's talk about two lessons from um, economics and hygiene. I was a, when I was a young, young guy, I was, very, uh, I was a fan of John Maynard Keynes. Um, he's an English economist. He had um, a large influence. That's me. <laughs> a, ner a nerd, a young nerd. Um, his most important piece of work was the general theory of employment, interest, and money. And I was getting, again, delusions of grandeur when I entitled my, a paper of mine, The General Theory of Escalator Energy Consumption. Another important economist is Phillips. He was a guy from New Zealand. He, was, he spent most time at the LSE. He wrote a very important paper in 1958. And what he said, he looked at the relationship between inflation and in unemployment in the UK for a quite a large period of time, 1861 to 1957. And he came up with a very important conclusion. And you'll see there's a point to this. There's, it is relevant to what we're talking about. He's saying that you can't have both. You can't have full employment and zero inflation at the same time. You have to do a trade-off. So he's basically saying, you have to have some, some unemployment if you want to keep inflation under control, or you have to suffer more inflation if you have to want to have full employment. And it's up to you as a government, you decide where you want to be. You just use Keynesian, Keynesian uh, uh, policies, you spend your way out of um, unemployment, and, and so on. So you choose where you are on the curve. It had a very big impact, but obviously there's a lot of criticism of what he said. It had far-reaching consequences for policymakers, and he, it meant that the governments can control the level of inflation and unemployment, but you couldn't have both, and that's the important thing. So what we're saying is a little bit of unemployment is good for controlling inflation. You have to put up with some of that if you want a better system. I'll do the video later because we might, might be running out of time. The other, th the other one from hygiene is babies. There's, there's, a, there's some evolutionary theories that babies do this specifically. Uh, in, it's, it's, a, it's a survival mechanism. They get the dirt, and that uh, gives them germs, and it fine-tunes their immune system. That's why usually you get fewer allergies if you, had a dirty, if you were a dirty baby, because your immune system has been fine-tuned, and you got, you know, and I'm, I'm almost talking not serious germs. Um, and that's why it's not a very good idea to keep on cleaning everything and you know, to surgical. <clears throat> so evolutionary scientists are saying that's actually a, it's a survival mechanism. Again, flu. Flu is an opportunity to fine-tune your immune system so you can combat more serious diseases. Okay, what's the point of all of this then? Well, a small queue can be very healthy for a lift system. Now, we worry about queues, but in fact, a queue is very, very efficient for a system. Because what you have, you have people waiting for a car to arrive. And once the car arrives, there is a nice queue which allows it to fill up and leave. And it's a much more efficient system than actually having no queues at all. If there were no queues at all, it'll have to wait, you'll delay the car, or you'll ask the car to leave partially full. And this is the price we pay. We pay a price for a more efficient system, uh, a less wasteful system, by having some waiting time. Let's have a look at an example. There's passenger arrivals in elevator. Let's assume there's no queue. So immediately, as elevator is waiting, the passengers are arriving, and they will board. In effect, the elevator is waiting for the passengers. So they're waiting for passengers to arrive to pick them up and leave. But 
If we allow the queue to, to develop, then we have a large pool of passengers. I'm not saying very large, but large enough to fill the car. And this decouples, it decouples the arrival process from the elevator. So in effect, what's happening now, as soon as the elevator arrives, it picks up passengers from the pile and leaves. And that makes for a much more efficient system. So we do need some form of a queue in the lobby. Not too excessive, but some queuing has to, has to take place. Talk about system loading. loading. This is the classical um, Barney Dos Santos curve, where system loading goes from 0 to 100%. And they've examined the system with simulation and so on. What I'm suggesting here is I increase the system loading above 100% because that is very insightful. So lambda is, um, is the symbol for passengers arriving per second. And this is what the system has been designed for. So if I give it the same what, what's been designed for, that's a loading system of 100%. I can then have either more than 100% or less than 100%. The simulator used here had no dwell timer. Um, it, the car capacity was exactly what was assumed in the calculation. Uh, we had initial conditions to avoid bunching. Let's look at some of the results. So you will, you will probably be familiar with this curve. This is floors in the building. So as you go up, you're higher in the building. That's time. The different color solid lines represent different elevators. So they're stopping. For example, this one is leaving zero, stopping at two for a period of time then going to 7, and so on. And what you have also plotted here is the, um, the queue length. That's the average queue length. And you'll see the queue length dropping after every uh, uh, lift arrives and picks up passengers. You have it dropping here again, and you have it dropping at different points in here. And if you analyze that, you can extract the value of the round trip time from that. And what you get, this is, this is the most important curve, most important result. There's a system loading. You see system loading stopping, not stopping at 100%. So we load the system above, because we want to see what happens before and after. Now, the, the solid black line represents what we've done under calculation, and I've normalized that. So if you normalize it, one it means 100%, so it's equal to that. You can see now that as we increase system loading, the value of the round trip time increases, because the lift is not going to wait for people to arrive. It picks up whatever passengers are available and leaves. That makes more for more efficient system. Now, as queues start developing, you start getting a higher value of the round trip time until you get to a system loading of 100%. Now, the important point is C1 and C2. That's where I've allowed queuing. So C1 and C2 have queuing. And the result is we haven't been able to achieve the value of the round trip time under 100% loading. That's a loss of capacity. That's a loss of handling capacity. If there were more passengers available, we could actually take them and leave with a higher value of the round trip time. In fact, the car didn't fill up properly until we got to a system loading of around 110%, 120%. ENF are two hypothetical scenarios where we haven't allowed queuing. And this is shown very clearly here. What this is showing is the value between the number of passengers and the value, the, the value of the round trip time. As the number of passengers increases, decreases, the round trip time decreases, and it corresponds to a loss of handling capacity. So the conclusion is, the loss in round trip time in this case is a loss of handling capacity. And if we lose one passenger, so if we're leaving on average with 11 passengers, we've lost around 5% of the handling capacity of the system. So this is explained as follows. The car does not wait for further passengers to arrive. Now you can change that if you want, but that's the assumption here. It finds passengers, takes them, and if there are no more left, it closes its doors and leaves. The car capacity is restricted to the value of P, which we found in calculation. And it's an integer. I've made it, we forced it here to be an integer. Now, there's randomness in the behavior of the system, which means sometimes there are more passengers waiting when you come back, and sometimes there are fewer passengers waiting. If there are more waiting, you can't do anything with them. You can't take them. You've got to take P and leave the rest behind. If there are fewer, you will take the fewer and leave. And the result of that is that we will have a smaller loading level. So instead of having P, you'll have P, uh, you'll have, instead of 12 passengers, you'll have 11, 10 and a half. And that leads to a loss of handling capacity. And this is an important conclusion. Any car departing from the main entrance partially full represents a loss in the handling capacity of the, of the system. This also shows something similar depending on how, much, how long you simulate the system for, and it doesn't make any difference. So even if you simulate the system for longer, you're still getting around 95% 
5% uh, loss in handling capacity. So let's conclude. It's well accepted that there's a discrepancy between calculation and simulation. What we're trying to do here is look at a micro level, a mic micro uh, uh, level to see um, whether we can understand the reasons for it because there will be practical implications. Now, the value of the round-trip time is smaller. This leads to a smaller a restricted car size with randomness of the system behavior is leading to a smaller number of, of passengers. And it, it leads to a loss of handling capacity. Having a queue under simulation makes this effect less pronounced. And if you look at C1 and C2, C1 and C2, one is constant arrival, and one is, in fact, is Poisson arrival. So as you start having a queue, it decouples you from the arrival process. So having queues actually makes it less important what arrival process is. There's a loss of around 5 to 10% in handling capacity. Now, the next step is to look at practical measures to restore the round-trip time and hence the handling capacity to its desired value. This is the subject of current research. Any ideas from the audience how to solve this problem? How can we get the... the yeah? Yeah, I, I suggest that this one too has a queuing system for cars. So you, you're putting like a dwell timer, sort of a dwell timer. That's fine, good. But not having simultaneous cars arriving at the same That's fine, okay. So let's say having a, dual, a, a door dwell timer, because we don't have really have a door dwell timer here. Any other suggestions? A road where. More passengers. More passengers? Work from home. Work from home, okay. It take, takes the passenger away. Okay, maybe you can see you want more, and, but it's probably going to result in, having, in, in waiting more for longer. There's another thing which we mentioned. Any ideas? One other, one other possibility. Yes, Peter? Just, just really, it's uh, uh, no relationship to the original design. Uh, the size of the car may have excellent. been too big. Excellent, excellent. So Peter yeah. Sumner, I think Len probably will get the, get the marks, bonus marks. What a great audience. Okay, so let's finish on... Um, on a vision. That's Alan Groves. Where's Alan? Alan is down there. It's uh, insufferable know-it-all. Where's the ger German audience? You understand that? Is that correct? Yeah. Correct, yes. And this is an irritating lift consultant who keeps on asking me annoying questions. <laughs> Doesn't leave me alone. So, what are you talking about today, he says. What sort of silly question in that is that? Uh, round trip time. I've done, I've done round trip time. For those who haven't been here last year, I've kept on talking about round trip time. So, I think Alan got, got really frustrated. So he says, how many, how many ways do you need to calculate the round-trip time? And I say to him, I've got to 10 and counting. So there is a serious, there is a serious element to this. I was talking about surveys yesterday. And wouldn't it be nice if we can actually close the loop? And I, I'm sure Richard does that all the time. He does loads of surveys and then links, if, links in the simulation back to the user requirements and closes the loop. But I think where we're still weak is in this point here. I think that link is still missing. And wouldn't it be nice if we can actually get to the end of calculation and do one, two, three steps, systematic steps, to say, once I simulate this, I know I will get actually the handling capacity that I was hoping for in the calculation. Hopefully that's, that's the next step. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.